Hello everyone and welcome back to our video newsletter. In this video I want to talk to you about the Baker Act and what can happen if you show up at a Baker Act facility seeking help and then you get stuck there. So what I'm talking about is the concept of a voluntary admission turning into an involuntary admission. So we get a lot of calls from, from folks whose loved ones are suffering from anxiety and depression um, and they've gone to a Baker Act facility seeking help and then they can't get out. And so the families call us and say, can you help us to get our loved one out? And how did this happen? So sometimes, you know, someone uh, in the family is having issues with anxiety and depression. And we've seen, you know, a significant uptick in those cases, especially since COVID. And we understand, even as lawyers, we've, we've really tried to make a point of taking better, you know, care of our own sort of emotional stability, our own mental health. Because when we don't, you know, we can't help people. And um, we spend, you know, our days trying to help people who are having these issues. So what happens is someone in the family is having an issue and perhaps they go to Google and they find a facility, you know, a place to go and they go there and they say, listen, um, I need help. I'm just not feeling that great. Um, can you help me? And the facility says, yeah, sure. Uh, sign, sign this piece of paper here agreeing to be assessed. And what they've done is they've signed a voluntary admission document that gives the facility the ability to keep them for up to 24 hours. Now, sometimes the, the person's gone there because they've called their primary you know, physician, their doctor, their, you know, maybe even their therapist, and that person said, listen, you, know, you should go to XYZ facility, they can help you. And so the person shows up, they sign this paperwork, and if the, you know, if, the, if the facility finds out they've got insurance, well, you know, as I've said in other videos, facilities love insurance because they make a lot of money from insurance companies treating people for Baker Acts. And I use the word treat, you know, uh, very loosely because they're not supposed to be treating anybody. They're supposed to be stabilizing them, then letting them go. But that's a whole other, other conversation. And I've sort of talked about that in many other videos. So the person goes there. They're seeking help. They sign this paperwork. And, you know, two, three hours later, they say, okay, you know what? Uh, I feel better now. Can I go home? And they're like, no, you can't go home. You just signed this document here agreeing to stay voluntarily. You are staying for at least 24 hours. And then during that 24-hour period, you know, they, they see, you know, one of the, the psychiatrists and the psychiatrist says, oh, you meet Baker Act criteria, we need to keep you. And now they've, they've gone to this facility seeking help, okay, they agreed to stay for 24 hours, even if they didn't know they were agreeing to stay for 24 hours. And the doctor there says, no, you meet criteria. And now the doctor decides to keep you for another 72 hours. So you've gone from going there just for hoping just for a couple hours to see a doctor and now you're stuck there for four days, okay, up to four days. Now, I use the word up to, again, loosely, because with these facilities, no one's watching them. There's no oversight. And so sometimes that 72-hour hold on top of the 24 hours, that bleeds into, you know, longer than 72 hours. So you've gone from three days to four days to five days, okay. And because no one's watching, you know, no one knows if the clock's even ticking, okay. And then the facility says, you know, I think we need to keep them even longer than 72 hours, okay? We're going to file for a court order. We're going to file a petition for involuntary placement. We're going to tell a judge they continue to meet criteria. They need more help. We need longer to stabilize them. We might, e might even need to send them to another facility. And they go get a court order, that, and your loved one is stuck there. Can you imagine that? You went there for help, perhaps, uh, you know, on, on the uh, instructions of your own doctor, who I'm sure meant well and didn't realize what was going to happen. And now you're stuck there. You can't get out. We see this all the time, okay? And I'm not suggesting you shouldn't reach out for help. What I am suggesting is, though, is that if you go into a Baker Act facility seeking treatment, in all likelihood, if you have insurance, you're not going to get treated. You're going to be kept there. You're going to be imprisoned, which is why when families call us, I tell them, okay, number one, if you want to get out, we got to take action, and we got to take action now. There's no time to drag your heels and, and think about it, okay? Because thinking about it delays potentially the inevitable, which is getting stuck there, okay? And the other thing is I tell families is don't sign anything. Don't sign any paperwork because they're not going to tell you what you're signing. Maybe the paperwork was not only uh, voluntary admissions, you know, agreeing to stay there, but it's like I'm agreeing to pay the bill too if my insurance company doesn't cover this. So don't sign any paperwork. If you need help, Reach out to a doctor, okay? If it's an emergency, of course, call 911. That's what the Baker Act was designed for, emergency situations. But Baker Act facilities are not there to treat you, okay? They're there to stabilize you. They're there to make money by stabilizing you. And if they're not going to stabilize you and let you go, 
This is not a place for you. And if you need treatment, this is not a place to go. So with that said, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. I don't charge for a consult. The phone's answered 24-7. Take care and be well.